we start this lecture with an overview, a plan for what will be presented. In this pre-lecture, we will address examples that combine both translational and rotational motion. We will find that we will need both Newton's second law and the rotational dynamics equation we developed last time to completely determine the motions. We will also develop the equation that is the rotational analog of the center of mass equation. Namely, we will find that the change in the rotational kinetic energy is determined by the integral of the torque over the angular displacement. We will close by examining in detail the motion of a ball rolling without slipping down a ramp. Last time we developed the vector equation that determines rotational dynamics, that the net torque on a system of particles about a given axis is equal to the product of the moment of inertia of the system about that axis and the angular acceleration. Today we will apply that equation to a number of examples. For our first such example, here we see a solid cylinder mounted on a small frictionless shaft through its symmetry axis. It has a massless string wrapped around the outer surface. The string is pulled with a force F causing the cylinder to turn. We'd like to determine the resulting angular acceleration of the disk. We'll start by defining the system to be the disk and calculating the torque exerted on the system about the rotation axis. The torque is produced by the applied force F, which always acts at a distance R from the axis. Furthermore, the direction of the force is always perpendicular to R, the vector from the axis to the point of application of the force. Therefore, the torque vector, R cross F, has magnitude equal to R times F and, using the right-hand rule, points to the right. We will now look at the right-hand side of the equation. The direction of the angular acceleration must be the same as that of the torque. Consequently, since the disk was initially at rest, the disk rotates in the direction shown and its speed increases with time. Since we know the magnitude of the moment of inertia of a solid disk about its axis of symmetry, we can solve our equation to determine the magnitude of the angular acceleration. Here we see the disk from the last slide with a weight added to the end of the string. When we release the weight, the weight falls, pulling the string and causing the disk to rotate. Therefore, we have both the translational motion of the weight and the rotational motion of the disk to deal with. We like to calculate the resulting linear and angular accelerations. How do we go about starting the calculation? Well, we can certainly start by writing Newton's second law for the weight. There are two forces acting on the weight, the tension force exerted by the string pointing up and the gravitational force exerted by the earth pointing down. We will choose the positive y-axis to point down here, which will result in a positive linear acceleration. For the rotation of the disk, we have the same equation as before, with the applied force F replaced by the tension force T. We now have two equations and three unknowns, the tension and the linear and angular accelerations. We need another equation in order to solve the problem. The key here is to realize that since the string does not slip, the length of string that unwinds is equal to the arc length through which the disk turns. Therefore, we can use our result from last time that the linear acceleration of a point on the rim is equal to the product of the angular acceleration and the radius. Replacing the angular acceleration in the rotational equation by the ratio of the linear acceleration to the radius of the disk, we now have two equations that we can solve for the two unknowns, the tension and the linear acceleration. We can now eliminate the moment of inertia from the rotational equation by substituting in its value in terms of the mass and radius of the disk. Adding these two equations, we find that the linear acceleration is less than g by a factor determined by the masses of the weight and the disk. Substituting this value back into the rotational equation, we find that the tension is less than the weight by another factor determined by the masses of the weight and the disk. We now want to look at the rotational dynamics equation in the context of energy.
Recall that by integrating Newton's second law for a system of particles, we obtain the center of mass equation, namely that the total macroscopic work done on the system is equal to the change in the center of mass kinetic energy, calculated as if the system were a point particle having the total mass of the system and moving with the velocity of the center of mass. We can obtain an exactly analogous equation for rotational motion relative to the center of mass. The derivation follows closely the previous derivation of the center of mass equation. Namely, if we replace the angular acceleration, d omega dt, in the rotational equation by the product of omega and d omega d theta, we obtain the equation shown. If we now integrate this equation, we find the relationship we are looking for, namely that the integral of the torque over the angular displacement is equal to the change in the rotational kinetic energy. This relationship is completely general, and it will prove to be a powerful tool in solving rotational problems. This result is actually more familiar than it might seem. For example, if we evaluate the integral of the torque over the angular displacement for the rotating disk on the last slide, we find that it is just equal to the work done by the tension force. Namely, the torque is constant and equal to T times R, while the change in angular displacement as the weight falls through a distance D is just equal to D over R. The product of these two terms is just T times D, the work done by the tension force. We have previously shown that the total kinetic energy of a solid object is just equal to the kinetic energy of the center of mass of the object plus the kinetic energy due to the rotation of the object around an axis through the center of mass. The first term is called the translational kinetic energy of the object and is equal to one-half times the total mass times the square of the center of mass velocity. The second term is called the rotational kinetic energy and is equal to one-half times the moment of inertia of the object about an axis passing through the center of mass times the square of the angular velocity of the object. For cases in which the object is rolling without slipping, we can simplify this expression since the angular velocity and the center of mass velocity are related in a very simple way. Here we see the ball rolling through one revolution. As the ball rotates through an angular displacement theta, the center of mass moves through a distance equal to the arc length, which is equal to r times theta. Therefore, we see that the velocity of the center of mass is just equal to the product of the angular velocity of the ball and its radius. We now can rewrite the total kinetic energy totally in terms of the ball's translational velocity as shown. Note that the total kinetic energy is now bigger than in what it would be if the ball were sliding with the same speed, since we need to account for the additional kinetic energy due to rotation. We've just determined the total kinetic energy of a ball that rolls without slipping. We will now apply this result to the situation shown. Here we see a solid sphere released from rest at the top of a ramp that then rolls without slipping to the bottom. We'd like to know its speed when it reaches the bottom. How do we go about solving this problem? Well, we have solved similar problems when the object was sliding rather than rolling down the ramp. In those cases, we applied the center of mass equation that says that the change in kinetic energy is equal to the macroscopic work done by all forces acting on the object. The center of mass equation still applies here. The macroscopic work done on the ball is equal to the product of the displacement of the center of mass and the difference between the component of the weight down the ramp and the frictional force. We cannot determine the final velocity of the center of mass from this equation, though, because we do not know the magnitude of the frictional force. We can determine the magnitude of the frictional force, however, from a consideration of the rotational energy equation we derived a couple of slides back, namely that the net torque times the angular displacement is equal to the change in the rotational kinetic energy. Now, the net torque is just equal to the product of the frictional force and the radius of the ball.
We demonstrated on the last slide that the product of the radius of the ball and the angular displacement is just equal to the displacement of the center of mass. Combining this information with the center of mass equation, we obtain our final result. The change in the kinetic energy of the center of mass plus the change in the rotational kinetic energy relative to the center of mass is equal to the work done by the gravitational force. Using our result for the total kinetic energy of the rolling ball from the last slide, we can determine that the velocity of the center of mass is proportional to the square root of the vertical distance the ball travels. We can compare this speed to that of an object sliding down a frictionless ramp inclined at the same angle, and we find that the rolling ball moves slower, since some of the initial potential energy has been converted to rotational kinetic energy. On the last slide, we determined that the change in the kinetic energy of a ball rolling down a ramp was just equal to the work done by gravity. We would now like to determine the speed of the ball at any arbitrary time. In other words, we would like to calculate the acceleration of the ball. We will start by drawing the free body diagram and writing down Newton's second law that determines the motion of the center of mass. We'd like to solve this equation for the acceleration of the center of mass, but we don't know the magnitude of the frictional force. The only thing we know about the frictional force is that it is big enough to keep the ball from slipping. The key to finding the magnitude of this force is to realize that it is the frictional force that supplies the torque that produces the angular acceleration of the ball. Therefore, the other equation we need is the rotational equation about the center of mass of the ball. The magnitude of the torque is just equal to the product of the radius of the ball and the frictional force. The direction of the torque is the end of the screen. Therefore, the angular acceleration of the ball is just equal to the magnitude of the torque divided by the moment of inertia about an axis passing through the center of mass of the ball. Looking at the two equations we now have, we see we have three unknowns, the frictional force and the linear and angular accelerations. We need to eliminate one more unknown, and that we can do, because we know that in rolling without slipping, the angular acceleration about the center of mass is just equal to the acceleration of the center of mass divided by the radius of the ball. Making this substitution for the angular acceleration, we can now solve for both the magnitude of the frictional force and the acceleration of the center of mass. We find that the acceleration of the center of mass is smaller than that of an object sliding down a frictionless ramp inclined at the same angle, which was equal to g sine theta. We conclude with a brief discussion of the main points of this pre-lecture. First, we derived the rotational analog of the center of mass equation. Namely, we integrated the rotational dynamics equation that we developed last time to obtain the general result that the change in the rotational kinetic energy is equal to the integral of the torque over the angular displacement. Second, we examined in detail the motion of a ball rolling without slipping down a ramp. We applied both the center of mass equation and its rotational analog to determine that the change in the total kinetic energy of the ball, that is translational plus rotational, is equal to the work done by gravity. We then used Newton's second law and the rotational dynamics equation to determine the acceleration of the ball down the plane. We found that the added rotation resulted in a smaller acceleration of the center of mass than that of an object sliding down a frictionless ramp inclined at the same angle.